And welcome, Emily from University of, I have my window all covered up. I'm sorry, University of Pennsylvania, I think, um, yes. for creative <laughs> approaches to data. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Esten. I am the Judaica Curator of Digital Humanities in the Research Data and Digital Scholarship Department at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Um, it's a very long title, but the idea being that I think about how we can use library collections within digital scholarship projects. Um, so one of our values in research data and digital scholarship is creativity as a way to both engage ourselves in our work and to engage others within research data and digital scholarship. Um, so for us, creativity means that we center our workshops and programming on wonder. We want to take risks. We want to find connections to other places within the university uh, and think about how the technological and content skills that we want to teach uh, expand to work outside of research data and digital scholarship. Um, so for the spring for our Earth Day workshop series, we wanted to think about highlighting some key skills in data management and technology knowledge, uh, while also creating, analyzing, visualizing, and experimenting with data related to environmental issues and the natural world. Um, and thinking about how what my role is in activating library collections and digital scholarship projects, one of the things that I wanted to highlight in our collections is the notion of data being explored through artistic practice as well as scientific inquiry. Um, you know, when we don't necessarily think about the technical aspects of building data visualizations, but think about things like who gathered that data, how did they collect it, how did they create this visualization and for what purpose? I can think about how different representation, representations of data coexist for different purposes. Um, so for this workshop, which was entitled Audubon in Action, Creative Approaches to Data, I pulled together three data sets with related content. Um, so first, uh, we have a copy of John James Audubon's The Birds of North America, which was considered the archetype of wildlife illustration, um, and we took those plates as a data set. Um, the second was the Birds of Philadelphia project on iNaturalist, um, which is one of the world's most popular nature apps for recording and sharing observations about plants and animals, and a project specifically for the greater Philadelphia area to document all the birds people come across. And then Xenocanto, which is a community source website for sharing recordings of sounds of wild birds from all across the world. Now, you can kind of get a sense of how these data sets might overlap. They all obviously have to do with birds in some way. Uh, and I tried to be intentional in selecting from uh, Audubon's work and the Xenocanto data sets, uh, those that were sourced within the greater Philadelphia area, or at least in the United States, so to maximize that overlap. There are also data sets that are collected by people who were interested and invested in wildlife to some capacity um, with very different intentions. So for this workshop, um, using combinations of those data sets, participants interrogated and created representations of the data within. Um, so we wanted to think about how can we find, uh, how can we focus on the foundational visual literacy and analysis skills in conversation with how we actually build such visualizations. So first, we looked at Audubon's plates of these birds as a form of data representation. Um, so, you know, we think of this as art, but it really does represent a data collection process. Audubon and his team recorded notes about bird behavior and habitat. They would shoot and kill many different birds uh, to pose them in different postures and select one that could serve as a case study or model. They would place them on this background to draw them to scale and use the research they had done to hand color the prints. Now, they're not necessarily accurate visualizations all the time. Um, there are some issues around something that he would think of as a particular species, um, actually being just a different version of a species. Um, there are definitely choices that are made in favor of artistic license rather than uh, scientific knowledge. Um, and others are probably just fake and he was drawing them based on other people's research entirely. But it's really interesting to think about Audubon's work as a process of data collection, what qualities and characteristics he's trying to communicate through this as a visualization, and how it functions uh, to tell us about environmental data of the past and inform the kind of work we do in the future. Um, lots of naturalists will go to Audubon's work as sort of a starting point for how we talk about data today. Um, so the second thing we did was creating photo mosaics, uh, which is, you've probably seen these around as a fun combination of art, photography, and computers. They were really popular in the 90s as like initial algorithmic art practice, um, and particularly popular for photography. 
So essentially, it's a method of arranging thousands of tiny photographs, which are referred to as tiles, um, that when viewed from a distance combine to form a larger image or a target photo. So in this case, uh, we use the images that were collected through the iNaturalist project. So all these observers who would take pictures and then record their observations as the tiles to create Audubon's um, or recreate Audubon's plates. Um, so it shows here that we're having lots of variety of colorization, right? So we're trying to match the exact color that is represented in the plate with sort of a dominant color that is placed in those observations. Um, so we can see there's variety here. Audubon could only depict one version of his target bird in a plate, but his work represented a collection of observations and stories. And in some way, a photo mosaic is putting those observations back into the work. And it also sort of highlights what we have when we look at these. So here in this version of the blue jay plate, we can kind of see where we're getting some colors that are being able to be really specific, right? So the darker blue of the blue jay versus like the white background here, which ends up being sort of a light blue instead because there isn't a picture that matches that direct white one. Um, but overall, this sort of photo mosaic is helping us visualize the number and variety of observations of these birds in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, and you can see here for a sense, right, so uh, Audubon has this one image that he's working off to create his plate, even though there's a representation of collections, but then we can zoom it into the photo mosaic and see how it's making up different sections. Um, and then the other visualization that we thought about was creating sonification, so turning data into sound in order to convey information or perceptualize data. So we use the observation counts from the iNaturalist Birds of Philadelphia project, um, and the sound recordings from Zeno Canto, which represent sightings of a given bird in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, so we did this over the course of a month. We would count how many observations there, there were. Um, and so each time there was an observation, uh, it would play the sound. And essentially we had the representation be each second represented a day in our data set. If the sound was louder, that referred to more than one observation on that day. Uh, if there was no sound, then there were no observations on that day. Um, so we did this over the course of a month, over the course of a year, and then showed what it looked like over the course of the project entirely. Um, so the sonification was helping us get at this idea of how many uh, sounds there were, but also kind of helping us highlight some things that were placed in the observation. So we would see, um, you know, there were lots more observations that were being recorded on Saturdays and Sundays as opposed to in the middle of the week sort of thing. So for each of these representations of data, uh, we talked about how to view them as both art and data visualization. So we would first ask some questions in the framework of art analysis. What reactions do you have? What kinds of relationships do you notice? Um, what questions do you think? How does this compare to other art that we've seen before? And then we'd contextualize it as a data visualization or representation. What is effective here? What isn't? What is the information being conveyed uh, that you can read really easily? And what information may additionally be there that you wouldn't have gotten from other forms? Um, and then finally, how would this be helpful, right? Is this a kind of tool that you might wanna see in a news article? Is this a kind of thing you would come across on social media? Um, would you present this in a paper or would you wanna see this in an art museum? Um, so we did this workshop uh, with a small group of people. It was really exciting. Earth Day is a tough time in the semester to really engage students, but it was really exciting to get into this idea of how we teach data visualization, not necessarily as a way to present an authoritative answer or question, but really as a way of presenting insights to inspire questions. Um, one of the things that came up often in the workshop was how difficult it was to unite these two brains of data art and data science. Participants reacted really strongly to these different representations because they didn't fit traditional standards of how to evaluate a good data visualization that we would typically teach in a workshop. But they also picked up on new insights in these forms that were harder to tease out on a traditional chart or spreadsheet. So thinking about in the sonification, they did start to pick up, hey, there seems to be consistency of when you're hearing silences. Or as we look at terms of a month, um, over a course of the, a sonification of a year, why is there a huge gap in towards the end of this? Well, it's December, they're not seeing these kinds of birds in this area, so those things aren't going to be picked up in that same way. Um, so for one, I'm interested in doing this again, but I'm also really interested in tying this to more substantial efforts within the libraries to look at our collections as data sets, not just the data sets that we make public, but how they're represented in the things that we have collected. And also to understand how visualization has long been an art tool in itself, something we widely use now in things like data set critique, 
um, and how that extends to how the ways in which we talk to our patrons. Some of the takeaway questions for participants included, you know, how do we engage data literacy that accounts for the myriad ways students approach and engage with data in and out of the classrooms? Things like photo mosaics or sonifications are taking on um, as really popular forms, but we don't always approach it in a way of this is something that is communicating data to us. And next, we were thinking about how can we recognize the limitations and affordances of each visualization or transformation or representation, especially in new formats that don't have the same types of standards. So thinking about a sonification and a ways of how do, how do we make sure that there are still sort of standards there? Or how do we approach it in ways that are both really helpful for data visualization or data science, um, but sort of respect the fact that this is an art form as well? Um, also, the question of how do we talk about data art, both historical and contemporary, in the history of data communication. Uh, and then finally, going back to the point of creativity, how do we focus on making these workshops fun and highlight the skills that we want people to learn, whether that's engaging in some code, how to build various visualizations, learning the tools that are in terms that are out there, um, so being creative as well as educational and working in data viz. Um, and those are my credits and citations for various things. If you're interested in trying this out with your own data sets, um, the Jupyter Notebooks that we used as part of the class are available up on GitHub, and I'm happy to share that as well. You switched to that right when I was about to give you the three minute warning. Oh, so, so oh, you, you, you're you running ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah. That was my warning. Um, thank you very much. Uh, folks, please use the Q&A. You can also add things to the chat. I'm going to go ahead and start it off, uh, but I may miss them in the chat. So please add them to the Q&A if you can. Um, I'm going to start it off with one of my own. Uh, sonifications seem a little complicated to explain to people and also to to set up even a little bit more so than visualizations which can be hard enough for folks although but photo mosaic was a, was a brilliant approach i'm interested in how you set up the sonifications what tools you used and and challenges uh in in teaching and discussing that you may have had yeah, absolutely. So in terms of sort of framing what uh, data sonification was, I use the example of the Loud Numbers podcast. Um, so this is a podcast where they've sort of talked about, they'll take different data sets, talk through what's really interesting about them and walk through the process. Um, I used a couple different combinations of libraries, but primarily followed the work from Programming Historian to sort of walk through that process. Um, and in the workshop itself, I was very much like, I don't necessarily need you to learn the libraries and things that we're doing, but I want you to understand like how are we making the choices of what the sonification is going to do. So the choice of, okay, let's make it louder or softer based on number. Um, you know, How are we selecting what is sort of the definite sound that is going to be represented there? Um, and it was you know, really this focus on there are lots of tools that are sort of out there, but people are not necessarily thinking about, um, yeah, people are not necessarily approaching this as the same way that we would for data visualization or, you know, in journalistic or reporting sort of methods, but it's sort of an opportunity to explore. So um, the exact libraries that I worked with, I don't have on the top of my head, but I really designed it in such a way that you didn't have to learn what was there. I was thinking more about what what you could do and opportunities and sort of standard structures aren't there yet. And you said you started from the programming historian, programming yes. historian website. Um, such a great resource. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Several comments about uh, not having encountered the concept of data art before. So before I get to, I do see a question in the in the chat please add to the Q&A as well. Um, any, I don't know, data art for dummies? I am I am a dummy about art. I can data, but I cannot art. So any suggestions where I can start? Yeah, I think that's really, it's a really hard thing to find um, because it is often talked about at such a high concept level. But I think one of the things that is really helpful to me is you know, looking, not necessarily starting with data art, but starting with things of like data is beautiful, right? So thinking about like, how do we just look at these visualizations that are out there and think of them as like, why are we talking about them as pretty? Why are we talking about them as bad? Um, sort of seeing them out of context without all of that other information, what makes this work? Um, and then in terms of data art, I think 
you know, it's, it's really hard to find resources because people are not necessarily combining it in that regard. Um, like there are people who are doing data art, but it's not uh, talked about in a framework, at least from like data viz perspectives. I'm not an artist by practice, so there probably are people who are doing it there. And um, so we have what may be an unfairly complicated question, um, as, as stated in the question. One of our, our attendees is doing an annual data jam contest with an artistic component, but it's with the public school, middle school and high school kids. So like K7 through, not K7, grades 7 through 12-ish. Any thoughts on how to scale down yeah, so uh, I didn't talk about this in my presentation, but one of the other workshops that we did um, focused it on a Dear Data drawing project. So we took a group of students to the Woodland Cemetery, which is just off campus, um, when we asked them to take data about the trees that were part of the uh, or trees that are represented on campus um, and think about like, we don't want you to write down, you know, uh, this tree is knotty, this tree has branches, but think about how would you represent that on paper? Um, and having them sort of draw out all these different activities. So we would kind of build up to that by doing, all right, first we want you to, you know, have a way of documenting how many breaths you're taking. So maybe you're drawing a circle every time you're doing a breath and then looking at it at the end of, sure, we could look at this as, you know, counting each uh, circle that's on the paper, but it's also an artwork in itself, right? Of Okay, how did this way you drew your circles changed as you were breathing over time? Do you see your circles getting bigger or smaller? Um, so thinking about like that as a structure was really helpful, and I'm happy to share those resources as well. And Chantel says in the chat, like bubbles, um, being able to focus there. And so building up to something like that, or we did all the ones that was like, how do we do a drawing of ourselves that sort of represents represents data. So something like, you know, how do we represent our hair color without drawing our hair color? How do we represent, um, you know, different hair textures without drawing hair texture and collecting all of that information um, without the goal of building a chart at the end or without like building a, a formal collection or table, but in a way that is like expressive. So I would start there. Hmm. Cool. We've also got some uh, resource suggestions. Yes in the chat anything else that we have yeah we have thank you <laughs> we have great idea thanks emily so uh, i agree entirely any other questions this was a really great engaging and and different way to look at data and data visualization sonification and stuff thank you so much and i think a lot of people got exposed to the idea of data art uh and and different ways of thinking about their data which is fantastic yeah that's so the much. goal thank you <laughs>